I shouldn't even be here. I'm sure that's what a lot of you are thinking. I was surprised that the people here would let me come back, but then most of the ones who are here to tell their stories today, they died before I did, so maybe they don't hold as much of a grudge against me as the ones who are living here then. I'm not buried here. I died and was buried far away. When they discharged me from San Quentin, they sent me to the state hospital at Napa. But since I am here to tell my story, I'd better get started. I was born Maria Kukuriksas in Najida, Hungary. My parents were unlucky. They had five daughters, but no son to inherit the farm. So our oldest sister and her husband stayed in the old country and became our father's heirs. And the rest of us girls came over here across the sea to America to make our fortunes. We came to Humboldt County because Mihaly Juhas, our mother's cousin, he had already settled here. And then on April 8th, 1902, in Eureka, Mihaly and I were married. We had a good life at first. Our George was born the year after we married and our Mary the two years after that. But then in 1910, we bought our farmland near Rio Del that we had been renting up till then from the Giacomini family. Or we tried to buy it. Old man Anton Giacomini, he died back in 1905 and three of his heirs sold their interest in the property to us. But the other heirs, Fred and that Abigail, Mrs. Lester Bryan she was and thought she was the grand lady and let everybody know it. They refused to sell. Mihaly and I, Mike as they called him here, we thought we'd bought the land so we shouldn't have to pay any more rent. But Fred and Abigail, they said that since they hadn't sold their interest, we still owed rent to them. Maybe we didn't understand the law well enough. Maybe our English wasn't good enough, though we thought we'd learned it well enough to get by. And neither of us could read or write, not in English. We didn't think we needed to to run a farm. but. It meant we couldn't understand all those legal papers. Our son would read them to us because he was going to the school at Rio Del. Albert Giacomini. He was one of the heirs who'd sold the land to us. But when his brother and sister sued us for the money they said we owed them in rent, he sided with them. Albert Giacomini was a joker. That's what his friends all said. They said he would say crazy things, but he never meant them. He just always said them in fun. It didn't sound like fun to me. Our friends and neighbors, they started telling us things that Al Giacomini said about us. He said he was going to fix us. He was going to get us. He was going to make us sorry we'd caused trouble for his family. That spring and summer when some of our calves died, maybe I was wrong. But I was sure Al Giacomini had poisoned them. Then there was the time someone fired three bullets into the chimney of our house. And another time when our George and I were outside, someone fired over our heads. We didn't see who it was, but I was sure it was him. I started dreaming. I dreamed Al Giacomini shot my husband. When I woke up, I was so afraid. I believed it was true. I thought Al was going to kill Mike, our children, me. So I decided I would stop him. I'm a very good shot. I learned to be back home in Hungary to help feed our family and stop the wild animals that kept raiding our farm. So that afternoon in September 1913, when I saw Al drive his buggy into Scotia past our farm, I knew he'd have to come back past our place on the way back home. So I got the shotgun and I loaded it and I found a hiding place in the bushes by the road. When he drove back by our place again, I shot him before he even knew I was there. The blast struck him in his eyes. It was my husband who found the body. I think at first he didn't even guess I was the one who did it. But then in the inquest, when the district attorney asked if I knew who shot Al Giacomini, I knew I wouldn't be able to hide it.
So I said, I shot him. My attorneys, J.S. Burnell and his brother, they were very good lawyers. If it wasn't for them, the jury would have convicted me of murder. In the end, they said it was manslaughter. I hadn't been in my right mind. They sent me to the women's ward at San Quentin. October 1918, they let me out, but not to go back home. Sent me to the state hospital at Napa. I wasn't able to go back to my husband and our children. Not ever again. Maybe someday Al Giacomini will come to tell you his side of our story. But I'm glad I got to tell you mine. Now those other people you're going to meet today, there's poor Abe Thomason. Everybody knows it's dangerous working out in the woods, but the way he died, I guess the best you can say is that it was quick. And Effie Fletcher, the daughter of Mr. Newell, the lumberman, well, the newspapers said she died of illness, but we all knew there was more to it than that. Mr. Albert Heath, I remember the shocking way he died back in summer of 1913. That was just a couple of months before I shot Al. Young Mrs. Scott, now they said there was scandal in her background somewhere, but she died the way every mother should be willing to die, saving her child. Mrs. Billings now, she had a good long life and a funny sort of death, but I guess there's worse things than having your death being awed. Bruce Chapman, I have a hard time believing it's really been a hundred years now since he and his four brothers all joined up to fight over there for Uncle Sam. And that young Mrs. McCauley from Oregon, well, at least she and her husband died when they were first married before their dreams could turn into nightmares. So all those people are waiting to talk with you. So you go on now, you go see them. Please, please just go. Abe Thomason. Abraham is my given name. I was born February 1878 and died in the year 1905. My parents are in Missouri. Well, were. They moved there after my father. He was in the Civil War with the 1st Texas Battalion. They moved there after he met my mother in Minnesota where he was farming after the war. My mother had immigrated from Ireland when she was just a girl. I had 10 brothers and sisters. Well, eight that survived, plus me. I was the oldest. My little brother Frank is only, was only seven years old when I died. He named a daughter after me, old Frank did. Arba was her name. I guess that's as close as he could get to Abraham. A terrible name for a girl, Arba. I guess she could always go by her middle name. My parents were farmers. It never did quite suit me. My Uncle Ambrose got me a job here when I moved out west at the turn of the century. Uncle Ambrose, he used to tell stories about a man he worked for, a Mr. Lorenzo Painter, who founded an entire city, Rio Hotel. Who ever heard of such a thing? An ambitious man, Mr. Painter, but cursed with madness. He drowned himself in the river. Uncle Ambrose, having been divorced in his employer died by his own accord, moved in with his daughter and son-in-law, who was a woodsman. Uncle Ambrose, he began cutting timber again too, and I joined him. Sometime after I died, Uncle Ambrose took his last breath in St. Agnew's Mental Hospital for the Insane. He's buried here now too. Just 27 years is all I got. I was a hard worker. I was a logger. Camp 8, Scotia. A peeler, actually. I used to peel the bark for the logs. It was wet that day. There was a crash. I lost my balance. I slipped. Legs caught between two logs. I looked up. A log had broken loose and was rushing down the hill towards me. I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out. I watched that log come for me. I had to watch that log come for me. It struck me straight in the chest, ripped my legs from my body, and carried me halfway down the hill. 
guts strewn before me, a trail of blood, men slipping it as they tried to get to me, for nothing. I was gone, my life torn from my body as my legs were, flopping there between those two legs. Oled, he was my best friend. He was the only one that would come near me after I, well, those other fellows, they wouldn't come near me. They used to take their money into town every week and spend it on whiskey and whores, really live it up. Not Ed and I. We were gonna pool our money, buy a piece of woodland, log it, make our fortune in farming timber. <laughs> we used to talk about it in camp, how we were going to do it. <laughs> but I lost all that. Ed got everything I wanted, all the things I wished for, everything I was going to have, but it never happened for me. We were gonna buy a piece of land, build homes next to each other, find a couple of nice girls, raise a family, really live. I lived another 50 years into his 70s. I'm happy for him. He's here too. It took a while, but we're finally sharing a piece of land together. He was such a pretty baby. His name was Benjamin, and he was just eight months old. James and I met Benjamin on the Redwood Highway, just north of Phillipsville. His parents pulled over to fix a punctured tire, so we pulled over too. James helped with the tire, and Benjamin's mother was able to take a nap while I played with the baby. As I was bouncing Benjamin on my knee and playing patty cake with him, I couldn't help but dream so many rose-colored dreams. When you've just gotten married, suddenly you find yourself thinking things like, maybe soon James and I would have a little treasure like him to call our own. Anyway, Benjamin's parents had mentioned to us that they needed to buy him some milk, so when we all set out driving again, our car just in front of theirs, we were keeping our eyes peeled for anywhere that might have milk for sale. Then we saw it at Mises Resort, a sign reading, fresh milk. We turned around to wave to our friends in the car behind us and neither of us were keeping our eyes on the road and that was the end of that. My father never much approved of my marrying James. I guess I couldn't blame him for that. I mean, James was just 10 years younger than my father and James's eldest child, Gladys, was two years older than me. But the way I saw it, what James and I had in common meant so much more than our differences. We both came from fa large families. We were both the youngest of four. We had three older sisters. Both of our families had been farm families, although James had left the farm to become a blacksmith. Both of our families had lived in Iowa and Nebraska before moving west to California and Oregon. And both of us had recently lost people that we loved. My mother died in November, 1923. And the year before that, 1922, well, James said it was the worst year of his life. Two of his sisters died that year. And then his uncle who lived with them. And lastly, his father. My family was living in Surprise Valley, Modoc County, when my mother died. My sisters had married and settled down there, but between you and me, the biggest surprise about Surprise Valley was that anyone wanted to live there at all. So, after my mother passed, my father and I wanted to get a fresh start, and we moved to Dayton, Oregon, and that's where I met James. My father and I had gone to his blacksmith shop one day, and James and I got to talking and, well, he asked me to dinner that very same night. At the restaurant, we just kept talking and talking and we never wanted to stop talking to each other. He asked me to marry him a month later. Of course, my father wasn't very happy about that, but 
He knew better than to fight me on it when he saw I wouldn't change my mind. He said he wished James and I every happiness. And he came with us to the courthouse to be a witness when we were married, November 17th, 1926. James still had one sister alive, his oldest sister, Jeannie. She lived in Iowa with her family and he wanted me to meet her. So that's where we were going, a nice leisurely drive to Iowa, seeing all the scenic stops along the way. Of course, we took the new Redwood Highway. It was just perfect for two people in love with so many restaurants and resorts, new hotels and shops everywhere and those wonderful trees. There's this feeling that you get when you're standing there with the person that you love, looking up to those trees that seem to reach all the way to heaven. So that's where we were, headed south into Phillipsville on November 27th, 1926. It was about 6.30 p.m., so Naturally, it was dark already, but there, in the light from our headlamps, we saw the sign, fresh milk. James and I turned to wave to Benjamin's parents. Suddenly, our car was off the road, plunging down the bank into the creek. And then it flipped onto its roof. Somehow, Everything seemed to move very slowly. And I remember feeling quite calm as I said to James, Oh, darling, here we go. We drowned in the bank, in the creek, trapped by our car. The last thing I remember is reaching out to hold each other's hands. Hello there, I'm Albert Heath, and for the life of me, it's a strange term, isn't it? Well, anyway, I don't understand why you're here or why I'm here because, well, I lived a pretty darn normal life, a good life, but nothing special, but, well, I'll tell you about it anyway. I was born and reared in southwestern Iowa. Dad was a farmer. My four brothers and I grew up working on the farm. When we became men, we became farmers. When I was 23, I married this wonderful girl from the next county over. And Carolyn, Carrie was what she was known by, and I were married for the rest of our, uh, well, my uh, life. Uh, anyway. We had six children, three girls, three boys, and uh, I was a good farmer. And well, by the time I got to my 40s, I realized that some changes had to be made because, well, you see, we farmers were too successful for our own good. The more crops we raised, the lower the prices became, and it just became necessary to change, to do something about it. And so we came out here to the Eel River Valley and set down roots. And I even bought a plot here in the Odd Fellow Cemetery. <laughs> well, I worked as a teamster. Didn't want to be a farmer, but I had grown up among uh, uh, animals. Uh, I enjoyed uh, working with animals and I liked getting out and seeing things. So Teamster seemed like a good job to me and I'll tell you that's what I did for the rest of my life. Well after a while it became pretty apparent that I'd do even better if I were hauling uh, loads to and from the docks up in Eureka. 
So we moved to Eureka and we lived on B Street and we lived on C Street and the children grew to maturity and they got married and established their families and uh, some moved away and some stayed. Uh, life was, as I say, pretty darn normal. Oh, we, we did have our, our big sorrow, our little boy, Ray, he, died in 1912 of tuberculosis. He was a sweet child. Well, anyway, in 1913, in the summer of 1913, they were finally getting to the last bit of finishing the railroad from Humboldt Bay all the way down to San Francisco. And uh, they were hiring on extra men to work on it. And I thought, well, this sounds good. <laughs> uh, the pay is good, and I'll be able to get out in the countryside because all that work was going on from Fort Seward South. So, well, second day I was working, I went to my cabin uh, after really a hard day's work. And let me tell you, at 59, you start to feel it. Well, I lay down to get some rest, and uh, uh, rest was not too good because, uh, well, those boys from the Utah Construction Company, they just kept right on blasting away. Now, it seemed to me that uh, they had been awfully generous with their blasting powder, but uh, I didn't think too much of it because, uh, well, that was their job, they knew what they were doing. So, I lie down, all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose. Uh, there's a, an explosion, a smashing of wood, and, and I get hit in the head by a rock, and then another rock, and I'm covered in stones, and everything goes pretty murky after that. I hear one of the boys say, he's surely dead. Another say, no, he's alive. And I guess they must have put together a train because they took me up to Eureka, to the uh, Sequoia Hospital, you know, the one on uh, 8th Street, right across from the new post office there. Well, that's where the last spark left the body. Now, I don't know whether I have anything useful to impart to you. But I might just say, uh, trust, trust your own instincts. When people just rush ahead with doing something, they may not know what they're doing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Margaret McTaggart Billings. I was born in 1815, earlier than anyone here, although there is one gentleman who claims to have been born a few years earlier. Oh, that's a man for you. Can't stand for anyone to take precedence, let alone a woman. <coughs> but never mind. You came to hear about me. So let me tell you right off that there was absolutely nothing interesting about the way I died. No, I wasn't murdered. I didn't kill myself for love. Oh, I wasn't burned in a tragic fire. No, I was just my usual impatient self pulling too hard on that stupid doorknob that always sticks. Fell over backwards, bashed myself against the seamer trunk, and did all kinds of internal injuries, and that was that. <sighs> but I had 85 years of a reasonably interesting life, so let me tell you about it. I was born in Glasgow, Scotland. My father was a shipbuilder, which may account for some of the uh, family wanderlust. But when I was 11, he took ill, and his doctors told him that he needed a change of climate. 
which is a caution against always taking doctor's advice. Well, we took ship for Canada, intending to live with uh, my older brother, John, and uh, my mother's brother, Peter. But my father died on shipboard, was buried at sea, a romantic ending, I suppose. But Mum and I went to live with Uncle Peter, and uh, soon Brother John married a Vermont girl, Marie Billings, and uh, not long after, I fell for her brother, Timothy. We were married in 1835, where uh, we settled in Henryville, and uh, he took up farming, and I began bearing children, uh, seven of them at the time we were finished with all that. <sighs> there was another move west, uh, this time to Iowa, where my daughter Jane made me so proud by becoming a teacher. Uh, she quit that job then to marry James Rowley. He's over there, a farmer. Uh, there, were, there were many relatives in the area, uh, Rowleys and McTaggarts and Billings and many more, uh, but uh, it was a very many-branched, tangled family tree, and I won't bore you with the details. Uh, there were a few interesting family scandals. Uh, what family doesn't have them? Uh, like the uh, sister-in-law, whose second husband she divorced, because he had two illegitimate children on her stepdaughter. <clears throat> well, then came the Civil War, and many young men, uh, cousins and nephews, and two of our own sons joined the Union forces. <laughs> Fortunately, most of them returned safely, although poor Val Rowley on the train returning home was shot and killed by his own brother in a row over some girl. Uh, Danny McTaggart, he had a very exciting time in the war. He was captured by the Rebs and uh, escaped four times. Uh, then he was made a captain in the, one of the colored infantries, a great boon to us abolitionists. Uh, and then there was our uh, son-in-law, Jeff, who had a, a much safer time in the war. He uh, was part of the uh, Army's Musicians Corps. <laughs> well, after the war, and uh, I, I understand that you've had a number of wars since, but uh, to us that was always the war. Well. Afterwards, uh, many family members moved west again, this time to Kansas, where, alas, my dear husband died, just short of his uh, 70th birthday. <sighs> again, we moved west uh, onto Colorado, where a bunch of us managed to secure a place on a wagon train, going further west yet to California. Uh, here in uh, Fortuna, uh, James Raleigh there, he uh, settled quite prosperously into the, uh, a timber-related business, making shingles and fruit boxes. And it was in uh, the Fortuna home of my daughter May here that I had that stupid accident. But that was in 1900, so at least I'd made it to the end of the century. And really, there's not much further west you can go from here unless, unless you sail across the great western ocean to that place that they rather confusingly call uh, the east. Hmm. Well, in all a good life, and I, I understand uh, from my obituary said that I was uh, credited with uh, uh, 24 living grandchildren and 35 living great-grandchildren. I understand you'll meet one of those uh, great-grandsons uh, uh, Doug, uh, this is Bruce Chapman, Bruce Chapman, he lives there somewhere. Uh, I never met him in life, but uh, I understood later that he and four of his brothers uh, joined the American military in what was <laughs> rather over-optimistically referred to as the war to end all wars. <laughs> well, that uh, 
That all that war business is your problem now, not mine. Here I am at peace. And when I float over this place, as I can do and you cannot, I can gaze out over the great Pacific Ocean. Mm. And I still have uh, seniority here, except for that one gentleman I referred to before. So uh, you run along now and, and meet with these uh, younglings. Um, Ta-ta. Bye-bye. I'm pleased to be speaking with you all today. Humboldt County is special to me because it was always special to my daughter, Froney, who maintained ties to Humboldt throughout her entire life. In fact, she's buried over at the Masonic and Oddfellow Cemetery in Ronerville. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Dora Rutledge Scott, and I figure I should tell you more about mine and Froney's lives before I tell you how I died. I guess I'll start at the beginning. I was born near Alder Point in Southern Humboldt in 1886. I won't go much into the details of my parents' lives and their history because the only family that was ever really important to me was my little daughter, Froney. I lived with Froney's father, Thomas Scott, in a cabin in Scotia. I suppose we were never legally married, not by a preacher anyway, but that didn't matter much to me at the time. Thomas was an Indian. He was a full-blooded Matol, and my parents did not approve of me being with him, and they definitely didn't approve of me having a child with him out of wedlock. After I gave birth to Froney, they stopped correspondence with me, and I heard that I was more or less erased from the family tree. From what I've gathered, nowadays it's all right to love who you love, no matter who they are. I just wish it was like that back when I was with Thomas. Maybe my family wouldn't have disowned me if things were that way in our time. Anyway, Thomas wasn't around too much. He would ride the range for area ranchers and timber companies all over southern Humboldt. I remember he always wore a gun on his hip when he went out. I suppose, you, I suppose you could call him a cowboy. At least that's what it said in his obituary in 1940. I always wondered if maybe Thomas had another wife and family somewhere. That didn't concern me though after Froney was born because she became my family. Froney was born December 28, 1904, when I was only 17. She was the best New Year's present anyone could ever have. I just wish I had had more time with her. I can still recall that last time I saw her and Thomas together. They were out in the yard and Thomas was bouncing her up in the air and catching her again as a way of saying one last goodbye to her. As I watched them from the doorway, I couldn't begin to comprehend how much I was taking simple moments like these for granted. Sadly, Froney was only two when I died. That day, I still remember it quite clearly. As usual, Thomas was gone working on some range and I was all alone with Froney, who was fast asleep. I was just getting ready to make dinner when all of a sudden there was a burst of light followed by a loud sound. It was a coal oil lamp explosion. And before I could even process what was happening, we were surrounded by flames. My only thoughts at the time were of Froney. I rushed over to where she was sleeping, all the while flames were lapping at my hands and face while the smoke grew so thick I could barely breathe. I struggled to get her to a nearby window and, was, and barely managed to toss her clear of the flames before I succumbed to the fire. I died in the hospital, trying to recover from those burns. I don't really remember much about that period of time, except for the awful pain. The only comfort I had was knowing that Froney had made it to safety. And I realized then that as bad as the pain was, I would have endured burns a hundred times worse if it meant she could live and have a family of her own. After several months, I died, but Froney lived, and she did have kids of her own. I think she lived with my Thomas while she was still growing up, then married a man named Henry Roberts, and they had three children together, Wanda, Kenneth, and Bernice. I believe they lived in Eureka. Froney later got remarried sometime around 1940 to a man named John Chilcott, and they moved to Lolita. There she lived with him and her seven children until she died in 1962 in Crescent City. She was buried with John and one of their sons, John Jr., over at that cemetery in Ronerville. At least she got to be with the people she loved. I was buried just down the hill from here without any of my family next to me. I don't regret dying the way I did though. I'm glad Froney was able to make a way for herself and grow up to have the life I didn't. Because I saved her from that fire, 
she was able to have children and her children were able to have children and so forth. In fact, she still has descendants alive today. It makes me happy when I think about that. Of course, there are things I regret about my life, but I realize now that doesn't really matter. I know that my life was worth living because it led to Froney's life and all of theirs. Howdy friends, my name is Bruce Chapman. You met my great-grandmother already, Margaret McTaggart Billings. I died almost exactly 100 years ago to the day, in the Great War in France. It sounds pretty impressive to, to say I died in the Great War, don't it? Like maybe I got blown up leading a bayonet charge, or took a bullet to the brain defending a hill from a dozen Germans. But it weren't nothing like that. You see, it started after I graduated high school. I started working in the lumber mill here in Humboldt. I learned how to fall a tree, how to work in a mill, that sort of thing. And it turned out that those skills I was developing were very sought after by the American expeditionary forces over in France. That was what they called the American army back then. You see, the great war we were fighting was one of trenches. And all them miles and miles and miles of trenches through France needed a whole lot of wood for the floor so it wouldn't get too muddy, for reinforcements to build up little shelters. Then there was the hospitals and the barracks. Then there was all the roads they needed so the supply vehicles could get out to the trenches with the fresh troops and ammunition. Anyway, they needed a lot of wood. And it weren't the case that they could ship it over from the U.S because the Germans had them U-boats that were sinking our supply ships. So they figured the best thing they could do was build those mills right there in the French forests and have the wood right there for the supply lines. That was one of the mills I worked in. Us boys in those mills, we had a real sense of purpose. The mills that I was working in was rated for 10,000 board feet per month. That's what it would have produced back in the States. But we worked hard over there, and the mill that I was in, we produced more than 45,000 board feet that month that I started working there. And it weren't just us, neither. There were lots of mills like that, producing four or five times as much wood as they ought to have been. Well, it weren't from getting my arm caught in a saw blade or a tree falling on me or a cable snapping and cutting me in half. It weren't from a German airplane dropping a bomb on me. By the time I got out there, Germany was on the back foot. They were almost licked. There wasn't nothing like that going on. In fact, I never even saw a German plane or a German bomb or a German nothing. No, it was October 19th, 1918, and I was in a little army hospital in a small town called Nevers, France. It was me and about a dozen other men in that room, and we'd all come down with the Spanish influenza. Now the influenza was just like any other cold at first. You were fevery, runny nose, sore throat, weak. But boy, it got bad and it got bad quick. I remember it was morning, I was drinking my coffee in camp and I sneezed and I realized I felt a little lightheaded and I thought, ah oh, shit, I got that flu everybody's talking about. Now I figured I'd lick it quick. Most of the boys who came down with it did. I'd always been a stout fella, so I figured I would too. But the next morning, I couldn't get out of my bed. A couple days after that, I still hadn't got any better, so they shipped me off to the hospital in Nevers. Spent three weeks there. Boy, you looked bad when you had the flu. I must have looked more like a ghost back then than I do now. It was about two weeks after I got to that hospital that it got real bad. There was so much tar gunk in my lungs. Just was having a lot of trouble getting it out. And one night, there was just so much I couldn't. Couldn't get enough air. They buried me in France. It was a nice country. I didn't really have a problem with that. The army said, 
if these soldiers could speak, they'd want to remain in the country where they, with their comrades, fought their last fight. Now, I thought that was a pretty nice notion. Of course, I didn't do much fighting, so I can't really speak to it. The only thing I knew was I was going to miss my mama and my family and especially my little sister Lottie. Well, my mom, I guess she figured that because she wrote a letter to the army. And, she, and then she wrote another. And she kept writing them letters till they dug me up out of France, put me on a boat across the Atlantic, and shipped me all the way back to where I come from. They put me right here. I was standing just right here when they lowered me into the ground. It was raining something fierce, but the whole town had come out to see my burial. I'm real thankful that I was raised and grown up in a town that supported their men overseas like that. I'm also thankful that I was only one of two Fortuna boys who actually died in the Great War, even though there were a lot of us who enlisted. In fact, my four brothers all enlisted in the Great War as well. My mama had that service ribbon hanging in her window with five blue stars. Mine was the only one they had to change to gold. That's what they do when you die overseas. But mostly I'm just grateful that I had that opportunity to go over there, work in that sawmill, and be a part of something that was so much bigger than myself. It's not every man gets a chance to do that in his life. Well, anyways, thank you folks for coming out and listening to our stories. I hope you learned something. It means a lot to us that you haven't forgotten about us all out here. You're still thinking about us and remembering us to this day. Have a good one. It was a pitiless storm and outside it poured and blustered while throngs of people made their way to honor the newly departed and could not find room in the church. It was February 1908. It was my mother's funeral. Her last words to my father were that she had no regrets in life and that she cherished all 40 years of their marriage together. I wish I too could have said those same words that she did two years later when I died. You see, when I grew up, when a woman reached adulthood, she was expected to marry immediately and have children. Otherwise, she was labeled by, as a spinster and shamed by society. A woman was judged and judged by her husband and she judged herself by her purity her submissiveness, and her domestic abilities. With any luck, she found a good man, that, her husband, that would honor and respect all the hard work she did in the house and be grateful for the fine family that she raised. I don't recall just how my mother met my father, Daniel, but I do know that she was 20 years old. She was a teacher and she had her whole life ahead of her and she wasn't just going to marry anyone. So she must have saw in my father that he would be a good husband and future father to the children because she moved from the East Coast to Humboldt County. He worked in the timber industry and he was so successful that when I was 13 years old, he built a family mansion in the Eastern edition of Fortuna when I was just 13. And then four years later, I married Archie. I was five months pregnant. Back then, it might as well have been a death sentence when you got pregnant out of wedlock. Your purity was shamed and your whole community shamed you. And luckily, Archie did want to marry me. It was bittersweet. I was so confused. I sat down with my mother on this blustery, windy day and and I confessed to her that I was pregnant and she, she just said, Effie, you must let go of your dreams now and the dreams of your family will come first. I felt robbed. I was out of 
choices in my life. Archie did love me and we did end up having two beautiful children, a, a Roy and um, Ava. And then 20 years later, my whole world fell apart when my mother died. By then, my children were distant and they didn't need me anymore. And my husband was working all the time. And my father, he married a divorced woman two years older than me. Not only was I jealous that she was able to make these choices in her life after she was divorced, but my father married just a year later after my mother had died. And with all these circumstances, I felt an emptiness and loneliness that went right down to my bones and my happiness just could not be recovered. And finally in my life, I felt empowered, even if it meant ending my life. Shooting myself was too violent. Laudanum, laudanum was the ideal choice. It was an opiate derivative that you could take and it would put you to sleep if you took m much of it and it would put you to sleep for good. But I was too worried that if I went to Bowman's drugstore, they would suspect that I was doing something. So I decided on Monday with the family wash that I would take the lie for making soap. I drank it and immediately it burned all the way down. And mistakenly, I thought I would die immediately, but instead I lay in bed for weeks until uh, my throat finally sh closed for good. My sister Addie stayed with me for all those final weeks and by my bedside and finally Archie and my children joined her. And as I looked in my children's faces, I remembered what my mother had said. She was right. It wasn't about my dreams anymore. It was now the dreams of my children. I hope their dreams did come true. Roy, eventually, he was enlisted in the Great War and thank, thankfully he came home alive. And Roy and Ava eventually, over time, married and had their own children. Today, there are descendants of Archie and I. So if I look back at the way society judged those things, I guess I wasn't a failure after all. I hope that today is different from you, for you, and that you don't have to feel the way I did back then. I hope that you never have to let go of your dreams. Thank you.